Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, city of Tucson. Get up, everybody. Mom, dad, boy, girl, guess what time it is? It is the Fresh Start Show with Dr. Holt. Listen, you know one of the most comprehensive and robust shows in the entire nation. There is nothing that looks like our show. Rather, from Michigan to Idaho, from New Mexico to Hawaii, Guam, Alaska, on the east side, on the east coast of New York and New Jersey, there is absolutely no show that looks like the Fresh Start Show. I'm telling you right now, we are the most robust thing that is on the air in America today. Listen, go get your, your cream of wheat, your Fruit Loops, Apple Jacks, your Captain Crunch, F- Fruit Loops, whatever you like, Frosted Flakes, the plain Cheerios up to Honey Nut Cheerio. Go get your cereal, your food, your breakfast, your coffee, your mocha latte, uh, your green tea, whatever is your preference. You want to make sure that you are getting ready for the Fresh Start Show here at 106.3 The Groove. Nothing like us. Uh, we talk about the real issues. Again, we're excited for another, another, another great show on today. And so we're going to be spending some time. You know, our show is to talk about the issues. It's an offspring of our organization called the Fresh Start International um, Organization, a nonprofit that helps formerly incarcerated people get back on their feet. Um, you know, as I always stated every Saturday about our event coming up, um, the Fresh Start Expo. Um, what is the one sh- which is the one stop shop for people who have been formerly incarcerated, and also we help people to not become incarcerated. We want you to join us on October twenty second downtown at the Tucson Convention Center from nine a.m. to one p.m. Well, we're going to be helping people that's been formerly incarcerated get on their feet. We're going to help you with your rights and restorations. If you have not voted because you've been disenfranchised to vote due to a felony background, we're going to help you be able to get your rights restored. We're going to help you get your conviction set aside. We're going to help you to get those expungements for marijuana conventions. And then on the juvenile side, partnering with our juvenile courts, if you have gotten a felony, your child uh, have gotten a felony in early ages before 18, we can seal those records so we are going to be helping people at the fresh start expo this october 22nd you need to tell your your uh your homie your friend your daughter your son your nephew your niece uh your community member or even member at 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 your congregation at church or the synagogue listen you want to come um, to this event, there's none like it. We will have every every jurisdiction of court systems there, from city courts to justice courts to superior courts to juvenile courts. Listen, we're going to be there. Pima County attorneys, uh, Pima County public offender, city attorney, and city public offender. We're all going to be there. Housing is going to be there. Second chance to help people get jobs with a felony background. We will be there this October 22nd. So keep your eyes out. Uh, keep your ears out. We will have, be offering free child care. So if you want to come down to the event and you can't get anyone to babysit your child, bring your kids with you. We're going to put them in a secure place. And uh, the girls and uh, girls... Uh, Girl Scout Clubs is going to work with us to offer that child care to make sure that your child is safe. So listen, it's going to be an awesome event. We will be doing haircuts, free haircuts, free hairstyles, um, primary care, mental health, all those vendors and partners is going to be there as well. So you don't want to miss it. The Fresh Start Expo this October on a Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Our mission is where everyone gets a new beginning. And we believe that on today and so it's reentry on steroids like nothing like what we do and so we're excited for this um, uh, exciting event that's going to be transformational for our city transformation for our community and transformational for our our families listen without further ado uh, let's get to it well, we're here with another uh, didactic prolific and powerful and prophetic uh, episode talking about a major issue that many times I don't think that we um, address, we talk about like we should. Uh, but I always say that if we don't keep kids behind bars, if we don't keep kids behind books, excuse me, if we don't keep kids behind books, 
we will put them behind bars. If kids don't get education, we know kids will be locked into incarceration. If we don't build more schools, we're going to end up building more prisons. And, and that's just where we are. And the school to prison pipeline is for real. And so today I want uh, to uh, kick off our new month with our show talking about the school to prison pipeline. It is a big issue um, and we don't talk about it enough um, but but when we talk about racism and we talk about racial bias and discrimination and all those different things, uh, many of our kids of color have first experience of what that looks like have come from the educational system and from our school system. And so um, I think it's important that we talk about these issues because we are routing children um, from school into prison. And we have seen this time in and time out, how even teachers sometimes, sometimes staff will weaponize police um, on, on campus or known as SROs, school resource officers, um, to arrest kids from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. And so we understand when kids lose all that instructional time, they disengage with their educational system, they begin to be integrated into the incarceration system. Listen, uh, I have a very special guest uh, who's well-versed into this, who is a, who is a, a lawyer, but also a former uh, presiding judge, uh, which is also a good friend of mine in our community. I've asked the Honorable uh, Ron Wilson to join me on my show on today and talk about these issues. Um, formerly uh, presiding judge of uh, the court for city of South Tucson, the South Tucson presiding judge at one point in his career. And so I wanted to have the judge, Judge Wilson, to come and join me on today. Thought it was very befitting, one, because of your scholarship, two, because of your experience, um, but three, because of your race. You're also um, a judge of color, um, African-American brother. You understand uh, what it's like, the struggle is real. Um, and then because you have a judge, you also have to be a part of that. So um, I want to um, introduce uh, Judge Ron Wilson with us on today. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Dr. Holt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. It's a pleasure. I've been wanting to do this for a while, so our timing had just lined up. So um, I want to take this opportunity. Um, but uh, just tell Radio Land, you know, a little about yourself and your experience as a presiding judge in, in South Tucson and, and whatever you want to throw in there. Sure. I'm um, originally from the East Coast. I'm uh, born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, moved here to uh, Tucson in 1999. Got my undergraduate degree from Syracuse University and my law degree from uh, Northeastern University School of Law and concentrated mostly on uh, urban problems and ur urban violence in terms of my dissertation, theses, other papers, um, and research was, was primarily around... Um, addressing the root causes behind uh, criminal activity and behavior in inner cities. Moved in that here in 1999, um, worked for Barbara the Wall um, in the community outreach unit, um, and then in 2002, um, I was appointed chief magistrate for the city of South Tucson, where I served in that capacity until 2012. Um, and while there, I started some of the first veterans courts, homeless courts, uh, drug courts, um, domestic violence courts uh, in the country that were not funded by uh, grants. They were um, completely funded through the um, operational budget of the court, uh, as well as the, uh, the city of South Tucson. Um, during that time, I also taught courses at the University of Arizona on um, um, criminal justice, constitutional law, civil rights, bill of rights, African American studies, uh, and then I was the uh, I was a faculty member for the Arizona Judicial College and um, the national director for the American Bar Association's Judicial Division uh, Mental Health Court Committee. So if there was a court uh, anywhere in the country that was looking for resources or information on how to establish a mental health court uh, as the committee chair and director, um, I would reach out to them or they would reach out to me 
um, to help develop best practices and strategies around um, uh, establishing a sustainable and scalable mental health uh, court in their jurisdiction. And that was in partnership with the um, uh, the Center for Court Innovation as well as the uh, Center for State Courts and a couple organi- other organizations. Right now, I uh, am a tribal court judge for two indigenous tribes, um, and I've been doing a lot of DEI work for uh, companies across the country, uh, mostly around social determinants of health and um, and addressing neurodiversity within uh, issues and prejudice, discrimination uh, within the uh, within a variety of systems, including public school system, education systems, uh, and the uh, the legal systems. Wow! So um, so I'm really excited to be on this show. Me and you go back several years. Yeah. Uh, you know, the NAACP, the Urban League. Yeah. Um, Dunbar, and um, really excited that you have this program. I know that it's making a difference in the lives of not only those that you serve, but um, you know their communities um, in which they reside. Because we know that um, it's much better to have productive, tax-paying, uh, law-abiding citizens living in our communities than individuals who are suffering from very various forms of trauma, uh, com- comorbidity, and as a result of the pain and trauma they suffer from, yeah. they engage in quality of life crimes yeah. uh, um, or are homeless or uh, even unemployable. So thank you for what you do uh, for our community. You are definitely part of the solution. Well, thank you, my brother. I really uh, appreciate that. And you're right. We do go back some years and, uh, you know, I thought this is a great opportunity. So um, this is a short show. So I got about 12 minutes. So let me hit a few things um, that can make our, our show really uh, uh, prolific and prophetic uh, for those who are uh, really, you know, having a difficult time coming, you know, out of prison. You know, we have a lot of so-called organizations say they're doing a lot of reentry work, but we have a lot of people still suffering and a lot of that those resources are not getting into many of the demographics uh, where it's really needed. And you know that when that happens, um, it impacts our recidivism rate. Um, But I want to go a little bit further into some of the root causes when we see a lot of these issues in the adulthood. I don't think, you know, Frederick Douglass said it's far easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I thought about, you know, when we talk about, you know, today's school to prison pipeline. Uh, As a judge from your perspective and a lawyer, um, you know, uh, with a shorter span of uh, an answer, so we can hit a few more questions. How, what, what, what would you say, school to prison pipeline from your lens, legal lens, um, and some of the problems we see? Well, in terms of solutioning the the public school systems and even some of the private school systems, yeah. don't have the resources needed or necessary to d- address the complex issues that young people bring onto campus. And so without the proper resources and without support from the local uh, elected uh, politicians, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for um, school systems to you know, turn the page or move the needle. The other issue that we very rarely talk about is the role that the judicial system plays in tearing apart families, yeah. uh, removing fathers from the home. Uh, creating uh, ancillary and tertiary trauma um, and being you know, somewhat um, absentee in their responsibility to provide alternatives um, for these schools. Uh, you mentioned incarceration and turn alternatives to incarceration, alternatives to juvenile detention that are going to provide young people who may not learn traditionally because they've got several barriers, as you mentioned, that they need to overcome, but can learn in an environment that is unique, uh, uniquely qualified to address um, the challenges that they encounter, and that whether those are mental challenges, emotional challenges, physical challenges, and we don't have those institutions, enough of those institutions uh, around um, in the country and definitely not in Tucson. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. And so, 
And what are your thoughts in regards to when we talk about school to prison pipeline, how that impacts students of color? Well, all the evidence and data shows that students of color are disproportionately impacted by this pipeline. I've read um, papers that have indicated private prisons are looking at test scores, yeah. uh, specifically of young people of color, in dis- determining how many prison beds they're going to need to build over the next 20 or 20 years based on the test scores of fourth graders. And so, um, and then when you look at who's testing into the, I would call it the incarceration or throwaway category, it's predominantly uh, African American men uh, or boys, yeah. black boys, uh, who are being raised without strong male role models um, in their community or in their household. Wow, wow, yeah. Yeah, because um, when I'm out, um, you know, teaching on trauma and talk about the race-based traumas um, that uh, African Americans and uh, black and brown children uh, experience, um, it's no secret, you know, that uh, they are expelled uh, three to six times more, suspended three to six times more. Um, and what, we, what I've seen on my side, and you've probably seen it on your side, is sometimes uh, school staff weaponize police to arrest kids of color. Have you seen that as well? I've seen that. And there's both implicit and explicit bias right. in how the um, code of conduct is interpreted uh, and enforced. And there's some significant disparities in the consequences um, that young black or brown boys receive versus, um, you know, predominantly white um, boys for committing the same infraction. In fact, they could be involved in the same event at mm-hmm. the same time. Yeah, exactly. And the black and brown kids are going to get expelled, um, and the Asian or Caucasian young men will um, get detention or a parent might get called. And so, um, so yeah, that is a significant problem, not just the weaponizing of the SROs, but the explicit, implicit bias uh, that exists within these school systems and, um, and how um, the consequences and the interpretation of these um, judicial codes of conduct um, are being uh, imposed on these young people. And there's no accountability for those hearing officers. There's no accountability in terms of the teachers or the administrators who are responsible for, um, you know, policing, uh, you know, this system. In fact, a lot of times they don't have any training at all on how to do it. They're just giving it, giving the responsibility because no one else wants to do it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you're exactly right. So what is your experience being um, uh, part of the judiciary on, in tribal courts right now? So uh, tribal court is very different than a municipal court or a um, county or state trial court. Most tribal courts um, are looking to utilize uh, restorative justice as a way to resolve conflict. Tribal courts have a very deep understanding of tradition and heritage, elders and ancestors, uh, and the role that their culture plays in addressing root causes. So problem solving isn't about uh, finding someone guilty, waving your finger at them, and then imposing some type of punishment. Many tribal courts, it's about addressing, as you mentioned earlier, the root cause, bringing the parties together to try to find resolution, which is almost more like a mediation, and understanding that the entire community is going to benefit from a resolution that, that is going to um, be just, um, but also is going to impose a consequence that will prevent future behavior. We know that many of our judicial systems um, our consequences and punishments don't prevent uh, and aren't designed to prevent behavior. It's, a, it's retribution, revenge and restitution. Um, and and um, there's no interest at all in recovery or rehabilitation. Yeah. In the tribal courts, that that's not <clears throat> the their focus. Their focus is truly is on restorative justice, rehabilitation, and reunification. Good. 
Good, 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 good. Also, man, listen, most definitely this has been great having you on. I'm going to ask you one last question uh, before uh, we get ready to end the show. Um, as a um, African-American uh, judge, what are your thoughts? How important is it to have more African-Americans as judges? One thing I'll see, um, I remember last year I was walking down the hallway of the Pima County uh, Superior Court and there was one thing that really stood out was out of all the portraits of the judges that sat on the bench, there was not one judge that looked like me. Um, I'm not saying they're not out there, but I, I, I have not seen it where it's really out there. And so that tells me that nine times out of ten, when defendants of color go before the go before court, they probably won't see a judge that look like them, especially if they're African-American. How important it is it to have more African-American judges on the bench? Well, it's extremely important, but you want Thurgood Marshall, not Clarence Thomas. Yes. And so, you know, although we want racial and ethnic diversity, it's extremely important that those judges of color that are appointed or elected um, truly understand um, the rule of law are not only competent but experts in interpreting the law and have some empathy and common sense when it comes to you know imposing consequences and sentences sometimes their hands are tied because of the sentencing guidelines but you know one of the things that that has been extremely disappointing for me especially here in southern arizona is that you do have judges of color or judges who are female um and they do not um, decide or rule in a way that um, demonstrates a certain amount of cultural intelligence. Their decisions, their rulings, their attitudes, their de judicial demeanor uh, is no different than some of the most uh, sexist and racist judges that I've unfortunately uh, have had to train or work with over the past 20 years. And so, yes, we want more female judges, and yes, we want more judges of color, but they need to be culturally intelligent, they need to be empathetic, and they need to be courageous, courageous enough to stand up against some of these laws that we currently have on the books that have been meant and designed specifically to oppress and marginalize those who are economically disadvantaged as well as people of color. Wow, powerful, man. Well, listen, this is the Honorable Judge Ron Wilson on the Fresh Start Show, um, and we, we appreciate you know your service and all that you have brought to our city and to the community and to the judiciary. Um, and so, again, we thank you for your time. I know you're a very busy man. Um, but thank you for uh, making that time to uh, be my guest on the Fresh Start Show. Most definitely, uh, this is the first, but this certainly won't be the last. Uh, we will try to get you back in rotation sometime before the end of the year to talk about the issue. So uh, thank you again, your honor, for your service. Thank you for having me, Doctor. It was a pleasure. Yes, sir. Well, you have a great day, sir. Thank you so kindly. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was the Honorable Judge Ron Wilson with us on today. Um, we appreciate uh, his prospect, his prospect, um, his perspective in regards to uh, his legal lens on um, incarceration, the school to prison pipeline. And we're going to be talking about this issue more and more as we go out go throughout the month. I got some other guests, um, some that's uh, running for justice of the peace. That's going to be um, our guests um, in a few weeks. So uh, tune in uh, with the Fresh Start Show. We're looking for some great things. Remember, we will be at uh, our the Tucson Convention Center on October 22nd, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on that Saturday morning. Join us. It's the one-stop shop um, to help people who have been formerly incarcerated. We also will be doing some warrant squashing. If you got a pending warrant and you had a failure to appear, listen, we want to help you uh, squash that warrants before uh, you get arrested and be thrown into the county jail. So uh, come down to the Fresh Start show. We will be there. Also remember the Fresh Start is having a Fresh Start um, breakfast fundraiser. Our fundraiser is next month, October 19th on
on a Friday morning at the St. Andrews Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona. Tickets, it's $35. If you want to get a table of eight, it's two fifty. dollars Listen, I'm out of time. Been a great show. Uh, make sure you tune in every Saturday morning at 730. We will be here at 106 The Groove. Take care. Have a wonderful morning.